Welcome to Goalie Science, the podcast that bridges the gap between goal setting, science, and peak performance. I'm your host, Jamie Phillips, a former professional goalie, currently pursuing a doctorate in physical therapy and specializing in goalie performance coaching. Joining me as always is Dr. Ben Cernick, a seasoned goalie coach and sports analytics specialist. Whether you find yourself at home, on the road, or at the rink, grab a cup of your favorite beverage and let's drop the puck on this week's episode. Jimmy, we're back. We're but back. Most important question over my one shoulder. This is immediately good podcast. Comp- Sorry, my microphone disconnected there. Hot start to the podcast. Um, we're back. Jamie's not going to cut that. So hi, everyone. Thanks for dealing with the first one. I'm definitely not going to cut that. No, not being cut. Over my shoulder, Jamie, do you see my Joseph Wall jersey that I got for everything? It's like, who got you? Like, did you? Like, who got you? That? By the way, the best gift giver of all time. Um, That's for I have never met someone who's better at gifts than my brother. Uh, he's, he's just, he's dynamite. He's got the jam. When was your birthday? I missed it. I feel like a bad podcast host and friend. Yeah, it was like a full month ago. It's fine. Ah, well, there you go. Well, everyone go comment on Ben's recent post. <laughs> Happy birthday, Ben. Yeah, thanks. So Joseph Wall jersey and his return to the NHL in uh, goals. Played well, though. He won He won that first game against Arizona and then back-to-back home and home with, with Boston. And uh, you know what? The important thing is he tried his best. So it's, I thought he played pretty decent. I don't know. I'm... I usually like now I'm at the point in my life where I just give like everyone's just getting the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, ah, oh, they tried. Hey, they look pretty good. I, uh, this is funny as the person who, um, gets given a really hard time about always talking about the advanced stats behind things. I, I haven't watched the games. I didn't look at the numbers of the games. I did just see the shots and the goals and I was like, oh, 850 save percentage. Brutal. Yeah. Like, I... without obviously, again, no context. I have no idea how the, yeah. So no, uh, you don't need even context. even even the person myself advocates to to look deeper. Took one peripheral glance and went, oh. So I'm I'm as guilty as everyone else. Send him back to the American League. Yeah, back down. Go back down there. Back down, uh, Ben. We're gonna let's get right after it today. So my my usual my hot take my hot take my grape the the issue that I'm having and it's more of me kicking myself in the butt because the season ended and the playoffs have ended for a lot of teams. Trials are coming up soon. But I, I mean, my role with team, my team play and stuff was was very small this year. I wasn't involved mm-hmm. like I was at Michigan Tech or anything. Hopefully that grows. But um, I found out the day before semifinals for some of my AAA teams that the coach wasn't telling them who was starting till like warm time. Hell yeah! And and I and my first reaction was that's that's still a thing because that was around yeah. But that was like when we were younger. That that was just like that happened and, pe- and people kind of were just like, well, well, yeah, but. But now, knowing what we know about everything and mental health and mental performance and athletic performance and how these things are intertwined and preparation, I just couldn't believe that that was still ongoing. And I rem- and so for me, I'm kicking myself for not asking them like at the start of the season, like what the plan was. So that's my like that's my fault, and I eh, I take responsibility for that because I just didn't I just assumed it didn't happen. But I just remember, like, I heard. I remember some of the dumbest excuses back when we played for why coaches would do that. And the, who's got to see who warms up better? Yeah, yeah. Who warms up better? Well, in the in the three or minute, minute warm up, yeah. four to five minute warm up. Like you're not just splitting that. Uh, there's also it was also like, well, I want you guys both to be ready. No, I hate that. No, hate no, that. like, it, and it, it had that. Yeah, it's, just, it's like, I, well, you should be ready to go in case something goes wrong. Mm-mm. Can't do that. No, I, was you... I, so I think I've said this before. Now, again, for people listening and, and people who should know this, um, I like to consider myself a veteran college backup. Probably. I uh, I spent two seasons of college hockey being firmly planted on the bench as a number two, uh, which is fine. That is the reality of, of being a goalie. But it is, speaking from experience, and then anyone who has experienced any backup time in their life, to tr- to try and be mentally prepared throughout an entire game when nothing is happening to you <laughs> is you can't I, you, you I don't know anyone who can do it and I think no. and again I don't know anyone who's ever done it to be honest have you ever run anyone in your playing time that did that who was like ready to go the whole time while sitting on the bench with a towel wrapped around the neck 
No, it's not. The thing is, too, is it's it's actually not sustainable. Like mm-hmm. it's and it's, it sounds crazy as it is, but but I'm gonna I'm just gonna go based off of, of professional hockey. Um, you know, we played around sixty, over sixty, between sixty to eighty games, somewhere between there, depending on the league that that you're in. And to be mentally prepared, that like, and you let's just say you break it up and you play fifty fifty, but to be mentally dialed that many days especially when there are back-to-backs and there are three and threes and four and fives it's not it's not sustainable mentally for anybody goalies or players and and it's the reason if anyone if anyone's listening that's near east coast hockey league um, team they play four and fives actually if you're in lower leagues sometimes they play four and fours which should actually be a federal crime Um, but if you go to the first game versus the last game there is, or even the the middle game, there's a massive difference in terms of play, in terms of energy, in terms of excitement. It's just because you can't be that dial all the time. Um, ben, you're going to talk about cognitive load and something you've looked at in studies. And we we did a we did a brief little review, and we couldn't find anything because and you'll did the nitty gritty about why it's difficult to measure. But anyone who's ever played, you know that feeling of prepping for a game. You know the nerves, the excitement, the anxiety, and then the game being over, and it's like I can't sleep. I'm exhausted. And you wake up the next morning and you're like, you you almost, for those that are old enough to drink, you almost feel hungover to a degree. And for those that are not old enough to drink, it's like you wake up and it's like you had a, you just had a really bad night's sleep and you're groggy and everything's, and like, and that's just because you've expended so much mental energy and physical. Yeah, and physical. We're not going to get into, we don't have to get into the neurochemical part and all that stuff and how those things are replenished and et cetera, et cetera. But imagine, so you're already exhausted now and you're playing half the games. Now you have to double that mental load. It's, it's, it's a, it's just so, just so ridiculous. And so like my recommendation is I always tell coaches that you got to give the players like four, 24 hours in advance. That way the goalie that's not playing can honestly kind of relax a little bit. They're going to be frustrated. They're going to be upset. It gives them time to deal with that, but it allows them to kind of decompress and they can actually they can use that time as mental recovery because they maybe they know they're going to play another game in the future and so they're going to be more mentally ready than if they were if they were completely dialed in for a friday game and then they have to play saturday um after backing up and like and then if you're a starting say you're a starting goalie or whatever level you're playing at like that's like you need that rest time like you're competitive and if you're the starter and you're you you know you're a starter, you know the best you're playing, you know you're playing the most amount of games. Like I used to look forward to sometimes having a day off. Like it was nice for me to show up to the rink and not have to go through my long, arduous pregame routine that was way too long and way too mentally dis- exhausting and play Super Bowl with the guys and have a lap and not yeah. and then you know, if things started to go south early in the game and you know like yeah, there's a chance I'm gonna go in. Then you start to perk up a little bit and you pay a bit more attention. Otherwise, you're just there to kind of be a good teammate, support the, the guys, and just take that as a rest. And so for, I don't know where I was going on this, I got off track by it quite a bit. Um, it, it's just one of those things that I thought died out, and I guess it's it's still alive and well, and that's just so frustrating. Yeah, so I think like one, like the starting goalie who knows they're going to play even the day before, they're already going to have those nerves. Those, you know, the like the natural like pregame anxieties that most people get when they're getting ready for a game of something they care about. Um, obviously, all people deal with it differently and how they handle it differently. But, uh, uh, you know, I'd say most often than not, when you're preparing for a game, especially as a goalie, you know, you're you're building up to it. So adding that layer of uncertainty to already that pretty stressful situation, it's just not necessary. Like you can avoid that pretty easily. Um, I just don't think you ever need to do it like i think you can always tell your your goalies well in advance who's playing like i am going to say something here it's not supported by data it is entirely a personal opinion but if i think you're a coach setting a lineup uh i mean in minor hockey you're not really setting a lineup but, but so in minor hockey like you can you can tell the goalie the day before he's playing like you you probably know like you're really yeah. not, you really shouldn't be on the fence that hard about For the it. most part you're also in minor hockey you're just like splitting 50 50 so yeah. And like, if you're say you're one of those teams that doesn't, which would be weird, but or if you're like the okay, the semifinal and final, the best. Yeah, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do the yeah. 45, 45, 10 split yeah. or whatever. Or just like or just you can also just text the parents. Yep. Just let them know. 
We just let them. Just quick text. You have their numbers. You have their you yeah. know. I said, oh, little Jimmy no, here. Most teams oh, use Ali's playing. You know, most teams use Team Snap or some other group messaging service or organization service at this point. Anyway, right? Like I think that's something that we can just move forward. We can just set our lineup. Our goal is like you can just do it the day before. It will help that goalie. It'll be helpful to the starting goalie. They'll have one extra less layer of or one less layer of stress. It'll be helpful for the backup goalie who's not going to go into that day all like wiry and, and jittery about that situation as well, right? It's just you're reducing the overall stress in your team environment by a whole bunch by being just a little bit more planned, right? You're making it you're making it easier on both goalies. Yeah, on hundreds of different angles. You're, make, you're taking out the unknown so that goalie can go through their routine with that, you know, you know that laser-like focus is all coaches want. Um, you know, just be to prepare. And then that other goalie may be disappointed, you know, has some time to decompress, to reflect, to be like, okay, like, okay, but I might be going, I might be going Saturday or Sunday and that's it. And now they have something motivation and they don't have to have all that stress. And then say you do need to use that goalie. Now you're getting a goalie who isn't mentally drained as a back, like, you know, coming in as a backup. Yep. Yeah. I think like, I think this is, this is a bigger picture on communication with goalies in general, which is just understanding and like clearly defining expectations for your goalie uh, and for your goalies. I think sometimes coaches assume that goalies just think something like, for example, I know that in college, um, and you dealt with this a little bit too, but it's not always clear in college. Sometimes teams hold three goalies. So three goalies will dress for a game in your first couple of years when you were dressing three, because back then there was. At Michigan Tech in your early days, like everyone sort of played. Like there wasn't, there wasn't like a clear, like I think I remember your first couple of years, like there was 20 games played by one goalie, 12 by another, 10 by, like there was a lot of game splitting at Tech your first couple of years. And I was getting none of them. <laughs> well, you were getting some, just not, I was getting four. Well, but the point being, like, did, was there a clear line of communication each game? Like, hey, if this goalie gets pulled, you're not going in or you're going in. Did you have that attack? No. So it was just like, we kind of had, there was, it, it was weird. At the start, there was like a, an obvious packing rule where I was number three. Yeah. But then like, as things started to go along. Phoenix started playing more. Right? Play starts playing more. Jano started playing less. And I started getting more relief. And... It just, you just didn't know what you were going to get. Yeah, you don't know where you stand, right? So I say this, and I bring this up because when I was playing in the States, again, we dressed three goalies. I was a freshman and we had two juniors. So two third-year goalies and I was a, and the, the rookie. And so the first time I got put in the game, I didn't know it was going to be me, right? Like I was like, yeah. in my head, I was like, oh, I'm the third goalie. I'm the new person, right? Because that just like wasn't ever like really made clear to me. And again, sometimes I think coaches... And I've heard this multiple times this year. Coaches like forget that goalies are part of the team. <laughs> and I know that sounds terrible, but you just forget that like that sort of thing matters or that sort of thing isn't commonly known. Like there isn't like a clear order. So you shouldn't tell your goalies that. I mean, again, obviously most goalies listening to this probably aren't dealing with a three dress goalie situation, but it's examples like that, that highlight these things exist. Right. And some teams, like, you know, like I said, I just assumed, like, assumed it wasn't happening because a lot of times the teams I was coming across, everyone knew. Yeah. You know, um, another one of my teams are just like, oh yeah, we just, we rotate consistently. So we always know it's flying. But no one needs to decide. We were just 50-50 split. Which is oh, great. I mean, like super yeah, simple, and awesome. And it's like super simple. You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to, actually one of my, I was in the East Coast of Florida. Like that's what we did. You really? Both goalies, really? Both goalies, both goalies are contracted goalies, right? So yeah. both have, there's a vested, both are decent. There's a vested interest in them developing. And fortunately, yeah. I, the situation got a little murky for me because Carolina had a, yes. 77 goalies. And it was just like the worst possible. I just had the, now I think back and I'm like, man, I got some really short ends of the sticks. But the coach there was like, you know, you guys are both side goalies. You guys both, the teams have spent money to get you here. And there's a, you guys are both goal. You can still play. So we're just going to split you. And they, you yeah. know, you know, not are going to get a reaching a chance and if for some reason we want one guy to play over the other we'll let you know and i think that's probably the right way to do it at the professional level in the east coast i think ultimately unless unless you have like a 21 year old goalie who you're like now nah, we want them to play 50 games you know yeah I mean? like you an nhl guy on yeah. a team and then you'll have a guy who's on east coast deal and then that point, the nhl yeah. that you have like you almost i mean those but those coast teams want to win too so something yeah. i like it's not like a lot of those times those teams will play like i 
And when I was in Jacksonville, like I backed up a guy who was, and I was on an NHL deal and I backed up a little bit of, cause I was just playing horrible and that's just how it goes. Yeah. But the, 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 almost the benefit of the doubt or that first opportunity and second opportunities usually come to the, the contracted guy because that's the whole point of having affiliates is use them, use that time, use that ice to develop your goalies. We yeah. gone over, does development actually work? Well, well if you better see a goalie coach for four months and then all of a sudden you get called up, then it's hard, hard to say. I think hard, like hard to say. Yeah. Well, ultimately, I think what this comes down to, whether it's minor hockey, it's junior hockey, like you they just communicate to your goalies early on. Like don't don't wait. It will they will not play better. You're not gonna inspire them by not telling them. I will promise you that. If it's like an inspiration tactic, if it's a scare tactic, whatever the approach you're doing. Um, as a coach there or as a, as a like it, it doesn't work don't do it. it's just kind of like in guitar this that's yeah. like it would be like if you're at i mean i'm assuming non-goalie oriented held head coaches do not listen to this podcast but if they do it would be like it'd be like imagine telling all your play, like, players that you don't they don't know their lines until like the first drop of the puck like it's not great usually they you sh- they probably know like going to warm-ups that who's playing with who Instead, it's just like, nah, like you're, you're just, you're just not it. You're just not playing. So I think that's like ties into a really nice transition period where I think we need to just, this is going to be a shocking statement. I think Jimmy, um, goalies are not like defenders and defenders are not always like forwards. Like there is a requisite difference and like a required mental and physical difference to each position. Right. Uh, some of the work you say something so bold, so so bold. Well, I mean, so again, this ties into some of the work that that we did in my thesis. I say we, I did in my thesis, um, that looked at positional differences and we looked at practice, but we looked at positional differences and forwards and D and goalies and tied it to other studies that have looked at other metrics. But when we are looking at like cognitive difficulty, like aerobic capacity, difficulty, leg muscle difficulty, we took like a bunch of different forms of difficulty during training. And like we found in our study, the goalies were like massively different than players, um, like not even remotely close. So goalies had a massively different like technical experience during practice. We actually found that they had a lower technical demanded practice. Um, but, you know, we've all been in practices where uh, the technical demand is not so high for goalies. You're telling me that <laughs> just taking flow shots from the bottom of the hash marks where you just don't go down because it's not even worth it. Is it technically demanding? I'm saying that. Minutes? I'm saying that. Exactly that. Not, um, you are just, you're just breaking the mold today with these hot takes. Well, you know what they say? Uh, these are, it, I actually get, like, I'm tooting my own horn here, but these are all things we think as goalie people and hockey people. And you can prove them. It was nice to quantify it. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. the whole point. Like, it was nice to actually show it and quantify it. Um, and so those results will be presented at a conference in June in New Orleans. So see everyone there. You can come see all the big, big hockey hot setting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, right in Louisiana. We're going to be doing some talks about hockey. Um, presenting two posters there. See everyone there. I know you're excited for my hockey take. But the point is we found that in practice, goalies obviously had this massively different experience than, than forwards and D. Doesn't, that's not, shouldn't surprise anyone. But when you look at previous studies so our, our our study we found that goalies had like an easier time than players overall when you look at other studies that looked more just at games those studies find that goalies have a way harder time in games than players so we have this weird imbalance maybe going on and i think again as goalie people as coaches jamie i think we that makes sense to us yeah where you, you can go through these practice periods your team's doing system for 45 minutes and you're just skating around your net doing nothing and then i Honestly, like I like because it gives that balance of the the week of the week along or week leading up a practice isn't so mentally and physically well physically it's pretty taxing but it's not not so mentally taxing that you're bur- you're you are completely burnt out for the game yeah and you shouldn't be and there's like a the thing is there's probably a healthy balance of mentally taxing though so like you probably want your practices especially from a goalie perspective to be have decision making. As a goal, be challenging. Yeah, yeah, it should be like, challenging. It should be mentally stimulating, right? Yeah. So what I think is, I'd actually, I'd, I'd agree in a sense that, I mean, if someone should look at this in their PhD, holy cow. Um, I am not going back to school. Well, that that was a joke about me. I um, <laughs> the thought of me doing more school it makes me want to vomit. I have six weeks left, and I already want to vomit. Well, I have four more, so years, four more years. Um, four more years, but. 
the point being there's like a healthy balance here, right? Where practice needs to be hard enough that you're still like physically improving, like think about working out, right? You can't just like not really work out hard um, and then expect to make the same amount of gains as if you were training smarter. So there's probably some level of that, but there's definitely the same thing to be said about that technical, that mental demand, right? Like the reason a three on one drill is harder for a goalie than a flow drill is because there's options and you have to read and understand those options, right? So you need to be training the mental side on the ice, like the cognitive, the, the psychological side on the ice by having that stimulating, challenging part, those decision-making things. Um, what should not be mentally challenging is the conversations we have with our goalies and the, the right? So like this, you had mentioned this topic before, and so this made my transition piece. You had mentioned this before before about things and ways that like we just like shouldn't do as coaches with goalies. Um, and I got a, I got a take for you. I think something that we should actually consider with goalies uh, in practice, but also in it ties into games, is like how hard your drill is for your goalies compared to your play. Yeah, like, if, I, I, and that, I, go, I, that goes both ways. Yeah. That goes between like a, like a two neutral, easy doing neutral zone four check, like so boring. And like, yeah, for a goalie, like you can go and do edge work, but also like you're kind of tired. But then you ch quickly transition into like a two on oh, three on two below the. Two on, sorry, two on zero, oh, three on zero oh, below the goal line, like a small area game, yeah. small area yeah. game where your goalie just gets roasted. Yeah, and give him a break. <laughs> so exhausting, and then it's like, oh, let's just do power play. And it, it, yeah, it, it needs to, it, you know, like we take a lot, and and as Ben and myself are are you know strength coaches and stuff too, so we have that basis and the way like we kind of look at it is through a lens of just general periodization and like workout progression. You know, when you're writing a workout program, you have the most technical and most neurologically demanding things first yep. when you're fresh and then you have your quote unquote hypertrophy or like accessory stuff that stuff that doesn't require as much technical effort towards the end as you are getting fatigued however like you just see like power play the time you you really want to be dialed it should be it's the it little be. thing you're doing you know like and that's just it, it's just crazy because it's one of those things that's like oh we just always done it that way so, no like Get a quick little warm up. Get a sweat. Okay, let's do some power play. Let's do drill. Let's do power play. The best teams that I've been on, that's their that was their structure. Is yeah. you do dr like a warm up drill. So it'd be like usually a can of the cup, classic drill. Classic. Classic. Clock. <laughs> Just get some shots and then power play and then yep. do a drill and power play and then do a drill and then it's like small area game or power play yep. and then you're done. Yeah, and so like this is actually Jay, this is a really wonderful point because that's something that I admittedly have not put a ton of thought into which is this idea of even within that practice, what's the order of things we do? I mean, I've been pretty vocal about the fact that we do way too much flow, just way, way, way too much flow mm -hmm. um, in hockey, like period. Like you don't, flow drills are what we call, like they're, they're linear, right? Go here, do here. Like it's just an order of things. There's no thinking at all. The mental load is zero, right? And like from our study, um, like we also found in the end, just talking to the people too, like those practices where you're like working hard on systems work and plays where there's tons of decision-making, you have to react quickly. That's mentally tiring, right? Imagine you do 45 minutes of flow, two on ones, three on twos, continuous back check drills. And then you're like, all right, here's the hardest thing you're going to do, right? And you should do some of that because that's how a game works. You're going to be tired at the end of games too, but you should be maximizing that time. And I think the way to maximize that is like, just do less flow, make stuff. It's also not good for players too. Nope. Like your, your exactly. players are fatigued as well. Yeah. And again, you can, you can do it, mm -hmm. but you, especially if you're going to work on new technical stuff, yep. take advantage of that where your players are fresh and they're prime. They're going to be able to learn and absorb. And then you can do, you know, you can do that space learning or like repetition based learning um, where you, you practice something. And then you can do something that's a little less cognitively tap, like and then go back to the stressful, point. and then go back and then yeah. see like how much did they retain? Are they able to reimplement? Okay, no, we have to adjust, adjust, and then it's just it's just better overall. And I think like you know, there's a reason that high level professional athletics, not just hockey, they employ people like Ben who who look at this stuff because their jobs, you know, they're the nerds and they're the ones <laughs> that come up. Oh, they're the ones that prove and come up with ideas, and then people will go in and apply it. And you can and they'll be able to adjust. It. Was this season successful? Yes. Okay. Good. Keep up. No. What needs to change? Did we mess up? Is the, is the data, you know, did data not match up the players? And that and so that's that's why these things exist. It's hard at a minor hockey level. Yeah. 
because in minor hockey and young hockey, it relies on the information provided from the top leagues and the leagues with money to support them. But again, it's also different. You play in the NHL, you play 82 games, your practices are 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 are the, like the very longest during the season because guys are tired and they're also the best in the world. Mm-hmm. So they don't need to learn skills. They already have those skills. They just need to move their body. <laughs> yeah, they're like, so there's like a philosophy in the motor learning world. Um, and this is a paper from uh, Nikki Hodges. But there's like three types of training. It's like training to learn, uh, training to transfer, and training to maintain. And so like in season, like in the playoffs, you should be doing like a lot of training to maintain on like a, a skills level, right? Where you're not trying to necessarily like learn these, have these super mega hard practices and things because you're just trying to stay fresh and sharp because you're using all that energy in games, right? Yeah. Like, and that makes that makes sense. Um, but again, there's definitely time and place where you want to make that more challenging. Jimmy, I want to kind of keep going on the actual vein of the, or the, the topic today. And I'm actually going to throw a question at you, which okay. is now looking at your career now, looking at yourself now as a coach and as an almost doctor of physical therapy, how do you feel now about bag skating? Skating for punishment. How do you feel about it? As an almost doctor of physical therapy, I'll give you the, my favorite answer of all time. Don't it say it depends. depends. No, it depends. <laughs> no, uh, I, I do me, think, I do run. Let okay, it depends. Let, give me some context. Give me some context. Let me preface this by saying that skating for punishment or exercise for punishment is like a no-no in safe sport. So like the, okay. the governing supervising body that says like how we should coach kids and how it says like you probably should not punish your the kids with actually You're kids. telling me that I have never ever seen anything enforced ever. So good job, safe sport. Um oh, hey. uh, I said it. But you uh, said it, not me. Make the I said it better didn't say it. Um, Thank you. I do think I do think there's a time and place for it, not really as punishment, but more as conditioning. And but I do Agreed. think Agreed. But I, do conditioning. Think, but I do think there are ways to quote unquote punish or offer some incentive that isn't just bag skating. Like if your team didn't work hard and you want them to, your team lost the game pretty poorly and you want to quote unquote punish them, you can do just like small area bagger games because yeah. they will get skills out of that, but they're also so exhausting. So tired. Like, yeah. like going man on man with someone for oh my God. minutes, just yeah. so tired. And you get, but the thing is, it's more, but it's more the spectacle. Exactly. And it's that's the, what they're trying. They're sending a message. Right. Right. And so you send a message by just having like a four hour video where you go over every game and that you're just like, just why rewind, rewind. Like you just, instead of like, just like ruining your guy, your guys or girls hips, you know? Yeah. Like, so I, uh, when I played in college, um, our coach was pretty funny in the sense that if there were, there would be like rules for like the practice and there's like very strict rules and some are very, a little bit more lenient, but one thing they would do is they would just throw you off the ice. <laughs> like, like so quick, such a quick hook that you're just like, nope, you're done. Like you're done. Yeah, practicing. I've been a part of that and been a part of that in coaches and it's not, it's not because it's like, safe sport rules. It's just cause you guys are bad today. Go home. Mind you, I actually, but like, I, 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 I actually didn't mean to do, do that. that. Hold on. Oh, boom. I didn't throw mm-hmm. players. But like just a player, like oh like, yeah, one person you're out of here. I well, I you know even la- last week for me, so I do my my Sunday skates for the organization. I, I had two goalies out, and they were exhausted. Yeah. Just and they were home. bad, and they were bad. And so I was trying, and like they, they weren't giving a ton of effort, and they weren't getting out of it. So like after 45 minutes, instead of using that last 15, I was like, look, we weren't very good today, and that's okay. It's okay for, but I want you guys to identify when things are not going well. If you're tired, you need to tell me these things in advance um, so that I can modify drills or we can adjust and change it. I said, like, just we're done. Like, we're, we're going home. Yeah, we're out of here. So I agree with that. The reason I asked about the bag skating thing is I've been to a, we're like in playoffs here in Ontario. Like, some teams are kind of done, like you are, like your teams are. Uh, other teams are still going because playoffs last an eternity sometimes. So long, so long, so unnecessarily long. We could definitely do this better. Um, that's what the that's what the NHL team does. Oh, and we need to treat our eleven year olds like we treat NHL players. I had a team I worked with who had fourteen games in eighteen days. <laughs> I actually think <laughs> about that 
and I, I, I do laugh because like the thought like after playing you know years of pro and years of college and junior the thought of me like doing the minor hockey or she can just play like two or three games a day she it was like a wet sweaty like yeah. it's just like ugh. but like when you're young and you're a kid you can just get away with it but, but man still, gross ugh. anyways back to the point um the reason i again the reason i brought the back is i've run playoffs and i've been to a bunch of team practices where the practice has just been like, I get up there and I'm there to work with the goalies and it's just like the first 20 minutes there's the bag skate and I'm standing at the boards watching the goalies bag skate. And I was, I asked you because I was really curious, like, as a, as a goalie when I played, when our team got skated, like, I always felt like such a dummy being like the slowest person, like, <laughs> just dragging behind everyone. Like, it's it's such a different experience of skating end to end in goalie gear than it is in player equipment I, that I still just struggle with it. From I mean, I struggle from ever like really making kids skate. I'm not a big make kids skate person. Sorry to everyone listening who likes that. I'm I'm pretty not for it. Um, I have a big push up. Uh, usually, what we do is we'll do something like we'll play a game and the losing team you have push ups or pick up pucks. Yeah, and like that's more like again, that's more funny. That's a little competition. It's different yeah. when it's like it's a competition setting, and like now you're you want to build that competitiveness. That's different mm-hmm. than like punishment, right? Yeah, no, it's it's, it's to create it's to create a sense of urgency to put something on the line. Yeah, exactly. Artificial well, competition. Well, I guess uh, not artificial, but some sort of degree of competition. When we have Dr. Rob Gray on the podcast, that's exactly what it, one of the elements of representative practice is like having like a risk to performing poorly, right? Like in the, in the game, does the the risk is you lose, right? And yeah. in a practice setting, uh, you need to have like some sort of trade off of like what happens if you don't perform. But I was just thinking about that, like in terms of the conversation state, where it's like things coaches hopefully shouldn't do with goalies. Like if you're going to skate your team, really think about what the goalies are doing in that skate. Just do me a favor. Because if you're like yelling at them to hurry up and finish the skate, like I promise you, they're probably trying. They they actually most of the time they're trying. Are you're trying so hard. hard? It sucks being the last person. It feels terrible. You're like everyone's done, and I know we don't want to be last. Let us go first. Let everyone, you know. Yeah. Let the yeah. guys just go first. Yeah. Like it's everyone, like, everyone laugh them. But remember, yeah. you gotta skate to the bench. You're like yeah, but I, my skate to the bench is like thirty feet. Yeah. It's like it, what I towards at tech. What I started to do is we I would. I would sometimes I'd be allowed to do goalie stuff. Yeah. Where it would be like basically just little interval sprints where I'd be like go to my push my stick stick up down da, 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 rest. Yeah. And like just get a burn that way. Because at least that there's hopefully gonna be some carryover. We're working a little bit more specific muscles. And it's if we're gonna do something that's probably not the best, can we make it a little bit better? And so that's kind of where where I was, you know, trying to get you know, that was where my brain was thinking. Yeah. Um I that also brings me to one other thing and you know towards the end and we're getting close to off-season training um and we're going to talk about off-season training and stuff as we go forward also uh for those listening we are going to move the podcast to every second week in the summer just because it's a little bit more sustainable for us and what we're going to try to do is to fill that time with interviews and so that we can bank a lot of interviews for the season and we don't once the nhl is done we won't really have much as much to talk about but Come to off-season training, that video, the Winnipeg Jets making Lauren Brossois slide with the hand. No, I don't know how many people sent that to me. Oh, Over 12. God. Over 12 people. And I, they made us do that when when I, when I was with the Jets. And it wasn't like a hardcore thing. It was like, you're just, they just do like 10 reps. And it, it's it's so dumb. But the thing is, people see that and like, oh, well, Lauren Brossois and Hellebuck are doing it. That's therefore kids need to do that. And they've talked to us many times. I've made many videos about this on my social media. And I'm going to replay it. I'm going to repost them because I do it. I worked hard on them and they deserve to be reposted. Two things. One, sometimes, like a lot of times, loading specific sports specific positions can actually be detrimental because we want them to be as specific as possible. And by adding in a load can actually change the, the like the pattern of movement, which we don't want. And the second thing is, just because they're doing it in the NHL doesn't mean you should do it there. They're already the best. It actually doesn't matter what they do at all. But what matters is what can we look at what things worked and what didn't work for all the goalies ever that have tried to have been successful and get to the top level. And then we need to narrow down things and how can we adapt it to each individual goalie? A lot easier said than done, but instead of being like, oh, well, 
Thatcher Demko, I see on you know Instagram, Thatcher Demko is doing drills where they're shooting at his blocker and he's pushing to the glove and not watching and tracking pucks. Doesn't matter, man. He's just Thatcher Demko doesn't can do whatever he wants because he's already in NHL. He's already one of the best goalies in the NHL. He's just taking shots to take shots. He's not. He's like you said. You're, it's it's practice for maintenance. Yeah, just maintenance practice. He's not he's trying to get. Practice. He's not trying to get better because he's probably honestly not going to get that much better. So. They can work at specific things if he's lacking, but again, just because they're in the NHL doesn't mean that you need to do what they're doing. You need to do things specific to yourself and your weaknesses, and that is what matters. Jimmy, my biggest gripe with the video, I did see this Laurent Prosois video. No one sent it to me, so thank you everyone for not sending it to me. Um, my biggest gripe is that he wasn't holding a medicine ball when he was doing it. True, that if he was holding a medicine ball and did have a skate weights on his ankles it would have been way better that's actually and that's the reason why he's the backup in winnipeg is he's not doing all he can be doing to get better <laughs> it's and, and obviously we're being facetious but um yeah again like it, it doesn't it's cool to watch it's cool to learn but especially when it comes to like training and stuff they're just at a different developmental level than most people listening to this podcast are although there are some pros that listen but to the like for the majority of our audience who are younger minor hockey into junior hockey they're just at a different place and that's a-okay and also like again and i know we kind of mentioned this but i think the simple way of putting it is like you can do lots of different training things and there's they just might not do anything right like pushing into a band it might be a warm-up more than it's anything like development wise right like it might just be a way to get the legs quickly burning, get a little muscle pump, and that's how they want to start their practice. Like that's something that they do, and they want to do that. Mm -hmm. They want to maybe they want to create like an early level of fatigue, and this is the most efficient way that they found to create a little bit of fatigue. Maybe that's the goal, right? You could, if that's the goal, you could replace that by just doing like thirty T pushes back and forth, and you'd probably be about the same level of fatigue, right? So, a lot of the times, without you know, we see these videos and things. We need to just be mindful of, of what the intent behind them might be and what the intent behind them should be before we implement anything into our yeah. own training. Just think about why you're One doing thing it. that gets that gets me too is that you look at something like, especially like you examine the literature. I mean, I, the strength coach isn't making them do that. Like I I know Wolfie there and Wolfie was is a great strength coach and he's never once hopped on the ice and made, <laughs> made his two anything. It, it it's the goalie coach. It's more of just like he's not doing it for any right or reason. He's just doing it to do it. And that's a okay again because they're in the national level, yeah. uh, the National Hockey League, the, the best in the world. Um, but you look at like strength training literature, like we know that um, like overspeed training can be beneficial, sure can. But you never see you never see that. It's always it's always the resistance training, resistant. yeah. and it's never for like we know that resistance training that that initial acceleration can be beneficial for creating that strength. Written tech, throwing the technique out the window, which is basically our biggest right yeah. because ice is very expensive and if you would rather you be doing specific things with that expensive ice but you can get the same benefit and the same yes. you know yep. stuff off the ice that's ba that's a lot of things where we're coming from but like you never you never see him do over speed well so what you're saying is we should be putting like rocket packs on our goalie <laughs> rocket pack that we need to have this ice slightly downhill <laughs> and then and then have them power push as fast as they can or it's just, but again, it's just like, we get any, can we get any goalie fart leg training going? A little, <laughs> little... <laughs> uh, that, yeah. But again, like a lot of goalie coaches aren't strength coaches and that's okay. Yeah. I think that's yeah. why strength coaches and goalie coaches exist separately of each other. And sometimes goalie coaches and strength coaches overlap. But again, you got to think about it. If how much is, you're spending $300 for the hour on ice, or you can spend 50 bucks in the gym. It's just like, I'd rather do a lot of like tracking and like, technique like positional stuff and then still get stronger more explosive in the gym yeah unless you have a lot of money and you want to do whatever you want then do whatever yeah. you want well exactly that's always the case yeah at the end of the day i think just be smart with it right and i think again in a roundabout way that's our that was our theme for for this episode which is just be smart from a coaching perspective be smart with the communication with goalies things we shouldn't do and if these things are happening to you as a goalie again i've said this before be your own advocate mm -hmm. right if you're if you're a goalie who's like your coach isn't telling you, don't. It's not really helpful to go whine and complain to someone. And I get it. I'm a big whiner and a big complainer. I can self-identify as that. But if you're having a hard time with coaches, and this is really hard, it's a really hard thing to do. But go talk to them and go try and be your own advocate. 
So if you're a younger goalie, it might be like, hey, go and talk to the coach, bring your parent with you. And if you're a parent, don't do it just as yourself, as just the parent, bring your kid with mm -hmm. you, right? Like these yeah. are all really valuable things. Advocate, have your, you know, as a goalie, advocate for yourself, do it respectfully. Don't, you know, don't assume that your coach is doing something maliciously. Mm -hmm. You need to advocate for yourself and advocate for your, especially as a goalie tandem, but you're not going to get anywhere like whining, complaining, and making offhand comments. You're going to get a lot of traction and get a lot of respect from coaches by having a real conversation with them. And like, yeah. hey, we're, we're going to, we appreciate you're making your mind up. Like we know you're, you're deciding, but we'll play better if we know what's going on. Like we, we will, like we'll, we'll be better. And if you want your team to win, you want your goalies to be better. So exactly. All right. Um, thank you everybody sure. for listening. Hold on, do you have a gripe of the week? Do you have any other gripes? No, that was my gripe. I had another gripe, which you talked about, which is like RVH collapsing your hand and exposing your wrist uh, to the shot instead of just opening up. Um, so if you want to break your wrist, do that. Ooh. Oh, Ooh. Uh, still not sure why it's being taught. It doesn't make any sense. Um, Jamie, but that's my I gripe. Got a, I got a, I got a, not a gripe of the week so much as a interesting development of the week. Oh, I don't, how much, how much, uh, Shisterkin, do you watch in your, your spare time? Probably not enough, but more than most goalies. You notice he throws a blocker side BH like more, more all the time. time. More all times than zero. <laughs> I watch him because he's one of the few goalies that still will keep their knee off the ground. Off yeah, the and they have yeah, and, yeah. It, and it's good and when they make a hassle save because it, it, he makes that save where a lot of times guys would get beat. So I usually watch that clip back so I can cut it for examples. Yeah. But yeah, he loves blockside RBH. No, blockside BH. Sorry, BH. And it's usually a dynamic position. Yeah, like he's on, not it's on a retreat. Yeah, yeah. yeah which is retreat. Which is pretty good. So it's again, it, it's for sure something I used to use when like a guy's coming in at a sharp angle. And like is that's because the V that's because the RBH literally was not invented. I uh yeah, I have like film from between twenty eleven. It's actually interesting. I have film from twenty eleven through twenty thirteen that I use as part of like going to college um, and like game tape from back then. And there's no RVHs. It's straight BH. And then I remember the first time I was taught an RVH, I told the coach, it was in Calgary, that World Pro Bowl 10 in Calgary. I said, this is dumb and no one's ever going to use this. And boy, was I wrong. You, you must have been at Tech when that happened, I would imagine. No, I was playing Junior B. That was just towards the last. So that was me between going from Junior B to Junior A. Really? So that would have okay. been 2012 or 13. No, sorry, you're, you're, you're bad at math. 2010, 11. No, that would have been 10, 11, and yes, 10, 11. Either way, 9, 10. This is this isn't a math podcast. Yeah, it would have been it would have been 10. No, it would have been nine. So no, it would. I don't. That doesn't matter. The point is the timeline makes sense because I would say the RVH slowly developed and then became mainstream in like 2013, 14 range. So I remember I remember I started using it in college. I also started using it in college and we started practicing it with Boosh around that time. Yes. So I went to learning it and I was like, this is dumb. And then the feedback from the camp was his hips are too tight to be successful. And only half of that was correct. <laughs> and it was my hips being too tight. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it, at no point did it consider that like, the funny thing, this is maybe a, a behind the, the peak scenes for people who listen to the very end of this podcast. Obviously, Jamie and I have known each other for almost 20 years now. Wow. That's a long time, man. It was a long time. Uh, but I'll have never seen someone, never in my life to this day, more dedicated to trying to become more mobile than you between ages like 15 through 21. And then like 21 hit and you're like, yeah, it's just not really happening. Like this is it. But, yeah. I tried really, tried really so hard. Like really I, hard. You used to sit in the splits machine for hours. I know. I actually, to be fair, I did get reasonably flexible, uh, but just yeah, like that's a little more anatomy. Like within yeah, I got as flexible as my anatomy would let me get. Right. And again, like going back and watching you, like even at the end of your career, when you were like as flexible as mobile as you're going to be, I would say like pretty bottom tier for professional goalie mobility. Oh, 100 percent. But the point of being again, and we always say this: like you need to try. Like you put in the work, it made you a better goalie, right? You pushed yeah. your own limits. Yeah. Right, but it's just like it's it's not as if like people who can't do that aren't trying to do it. That's kind of my point, I guess. Yes, agreed. So, long story short, the Broncos side of VH is alive and well in a dynamic position from Shisterkin. And I also saw him. I was watching tape of him today. I saw him windmill a glove save, and 
just didn't catch the puck. He just punched it in the air 400 feet. It doesn't matter what they do. They're in the NHL. He rocks. He's so fun to watch. Anyways, the point of this ramble is to say that if you haven't liked and subscribed on this video, what are you doing? It's YouTube. It's the podcast. Do it. Also, while you're liking and subscribing, then you unsubscribe and resubscribe. Also, subscribe to Jamie's Patreon um, because you're already clicking buttons and putting your credit card information in there, and you should do that some more. And there's a lot of good videos coming up, too. I Actually, in the last month, um, I've been putting up a lot of videos. So if you're on the Patreon, uh, it's 10 bucks a month. It helps support myself. It also supports the pod because that money from there oh, goes to our little our little expenses that we have for the pod. It does not go to help. It does not go to help Ben. I'll tell you it that. does not go to help Ben, but that's because Ben is uh, Ben. Ben made his life choices. <laughs> um, there we go. Did you did you you didn't listen to the solo episode I did last week? This was your I, I did not know. No. Um, over the end, there is a Oscars worthy plug for your Patreon. At the end, I poured my heart and soul into it. Hey, and you know what? I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Okay. All right. We'll see everybody next week. Until next time.